opening the infrared treasure chest with the James Webb Space Telescope. I think everyone knows this is an international project uh, um, with NASA, European Space Agency, and Canadian Space Agency as partners. Um, and it has taken 20,000 engineers and technicians, at least, to put this entire project together. So on behalf of everyone who built it, we are happy to make this gift to the world. Uh, it's available for use by all astronomers. We uh, receive proposals once a year about what to look at. So I will show you some of the top uh, images that we've gotten and tell you why they're important. So in the picture, you see a great golden hexagon, which is the mirror of the telescope itself. It's actually not solid gold, of course. It's a very thin sheet of, uh, of uh, beryllium, very lightweight material. Um, it's coated with an even thinner sheet of gold uh, so that it reflects the infrared light that we want to pick up. The telescope is protected from the heat of the sun and the earth by the gray uh, pack plastic uh, umbrella that you see below the telescope. We call it a sunshade. So there it is in outer space as we will never see it. So what we're pursuing is how did we get here from the Big Bang? What happened along the way? So back in 1927, which is 95 years ago, it was predicted um, that the universe must be expanding uh, by George Lemaitre. Uh, yeah a theoretical cosmologist, as well as being a parish priest in Belgium. And he uh, did not, however, draw this graph uh, that was drawn two years later by Edwin Hubble. Uh, so now we call it the, the uh, hubble lemaitre law of the expansion of the universe. Each little dot on here is a galaxy. And the picture shows that uh, if you plot the distance versus the speed of motion, uh, that most of the galaxies in, this, in the entire sky are going away from us with the speed proportional to distance. Divide the distance by the speed and you get the apparent age of the universe. So the first time we ever had any idea that there was an age to the universe, aside from uh, um, attempts to calculate things uh, from the Bible. <laughs> so there it is, the expanding universe story, uh, almost a century old. And then the, then the question is, well, what, what happened next? How, what was it like when the universe was young? How did the galaxies grow? So let's find out. So we have built the James Webb Space Telescope, and here it is unfolding itself in outer space. Uh, greatly speeded up. This process took two weeks altogether to do. Um, first, we unfolded the solar panels to get electricity. Then we unfolded the antenna to point back at Earth and talk rapidly back and forth. Now in the movie, we're showing you the uh, unfolding of the sunshade, separating the telescope from the warm part of the spacecraft so it can cool off, unrolling the covers over the sunshade. And you look at this and you say, isn't that incredibly complicated? And the answer is absolutely it is. Uh, if we could have found a simpler, cheaper, easier way to do it, we certainly would have. But as far as we can tell, there is no alternative to this method of looking at the early universe. So, okay, um, suddenly the computer jumped back. Let's see if we can do this again here. We're pushing out the uh, sunshade. Separating the five layers of the sunshade so that the telescope can cool off to a very low temperature. So why would we want the telescope to be cold? That's so it does not emit infrared light. Well, the infrared light is what we're trying to detect. It's something that the Hubble Space Telescope could not do because the Hubble Telescope is warm, like you and me. It emits a lot of infrared all by itself. So here's the telescope uh, as it's unfolded in outer space at this point, not yet ready for business because it's still warm and still has not yet been focused. That was part of the process of the first six months of the operation of this observatory. Uh, we launched it on Christmas Day in 2021, and it took six months, almost to the exact day, to get it all ready and going. So that's the story of the telescope. Now, um, OK, computer, next picture. Come on, come on computer. So why would we want to observe infrared light? <laughs> we 
here's a pretty picture of a, a place observed by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is the regular visible light camera picture. And this is what it looks like when you use the infrared capability of even the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the dust grains that uh, obscured the view there are, are much more hidden in this picture. Uh, infrared light can go around dust grains and see inside the clouds where those stars are being born. And in fact, in this one, you see a new star with jets sticking out of it, uh, which is typical when new stars are being born. Another reason is to see things because that are too cool to emit their visible light. So this is a picture taken by the web on the on the left and the right are uh, different infrared wavelengths that we can see with the web. So you know, we've uh, magnified it a bit. So it turns out this star is actually a double. Uh, one of them has uh, been spinning out its surface into outer space. And so now we're able to understand something more about what happens to stars when they get old. When the sun gets old, it is also going to start spitting out its material into outer space. Uh, and it will not be a good time for us here on Little Earth. A uh, third reason is because space expands. As the universe is expanding, the, the galaxies are rushing away from us. The, the light that we receive from them is also stretched out. So here's the illustration of that. So by the time we receive the light, it has much longer wavelengths than it had when it was sent out. And so we need an infrared telescope to pick up visible and even ultraviolet light from the most distant galaxies. So here's another version of that, that explanation. So build us an infrared telescope. That's what the scientific community told us back in 1995 when they wrote a little report. So what did we see with the observatory? Here is uh, one of our first pictures. It's called Stefan's Quintet. There are five galaxies in the picture. Uh, four of them are close to each other. And the fifth one, the uh, one on the left, is actually much closer to us, not connected to the other four. Um, this is a fascinating picture because it tells us something of the history of galaxies. Um, they hardly ever form all alone. Uh, they are usually formed from uh, small pieces being pulled together by gravity. Uh, and here we see in the middle, um, the two little galaxies are being uh, attracted to each other. Uh, new bursts of stars are being formed in the red areas. And, this, and the galaxy at the top actually has a black hole in the middle which we are also studying. Uh, we can learn everything about what's in the neighborhood of the black hole with our new telescope. Here is another beautiful picture. It's called the Cartwheel Galaxy. Um, and this tells us an um, astonishing story. The uh, story is that the little red galaxy in the upper left passed straight through the center of the big galaxy and made a splash. So what we're seeing here is uh, bursts of new stars formed. They're lighting up a red in the picture. And so um, we're learning about how do galaxies grow, collide, and interact with each other. This is a picture of another galaxy uh, that's been processed by an, a um, citizen scientist, Judy Schmidt. Uh, and she's processed this so you can see that this galaxy has holes in it. So why does a galaxy have holes in it? It's because stars that uh, <clears throat> become very bright and very hot can produce enormous pressures in the gaseous material and actually clear out huge regions of space. So that's what we're seeing. This uh, galaxy looks like a slice through a sponge with holes. So it um, tells us the history. And we're curious, of course, to know this because the Milky Way is like this, or at least if you could see it from outside, and therefore, um, this is telling us about the history of the sun and, the, uh, and our environment. How did the Earth come to be like Earth? So uh, we take a, we've taken a picture of this one. This is called the Carina Nebula. Carina is a constellation in the southern sky. Um, this is a place where stars are being born in this cloud of gas and dust. And the infrared capability of the web enables us to see partially through the dust clouds, but even the infrared capability that we have 
and doesn't let us see all the way inside. Nevertheless, this is a place where we can see it happening. Of course, stars are being born with their planets in there. And we'd like to know more about that. We're just beginning. But you can see all kinds of fascinating features in here. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but here's one little thing you can, it looks like the wind is blowing there. Here's another one where the wind is blowing in the other direction, bending, uh, bending the jets around. So here's a, a magnified versions of one of these things. If we could understand what we're seeing here, we would know a lot more about how stars are born, how the planets are formed, and uh, answer one of the great mysteries of life here on Earth. Where did we come from? So why, by the way, do stars form in these places? Um, stars form when uh, the gravitational forces on the material around this area, uh, this gaseous material in space, are greater than the uh, pressures that are holding them apart. So uh, how does the pressure go down? The pressure goes down when the gas can get cool, and the dust grains allow the gas to get cool because they radiate heat away. So new stars are being formed in the coldest and densest regions. So here's a picture of one of our favorite spots, uh, the Orion Nebula in uh, the Sword of Orion. The third, third, the middle star in the Sword of Orion it actually is not just a star, it's a whole cloud of stars with new stars being born in a nebula. It's beautiful in binoculars, it's beautiful in telescopes, and it's a place where astronomers always point their new telescopes because there's always something to find. We get a picture of Jupiter. In the infrared, it looks quite different from the visible light pictures we're accustomed to. And in particular, we see auroras on Jupiter. The uh, orange the zones that you see at the north and south pole are the aurora. We can see them directly in infrared wavelengths. The picture is quite sharp, uh, as we were expecting. And other pictures that we've taken out there uh, show that all of the satellites of Jupiter are also easily found. Uh, this is one, this is a picture taken a long time ago from the Galileo mission, which was launched by Jet Propulsion Laboratory to visit Jupiter and its satellites. They found that the satellite itself is wet. It's got an ocean covered with ice. And then more recently, we found that there are places where water comes spitting out from the cracks in the ice. And of course, that means we've got to go look. Is there a sign that that material coming out possibly has organic material? Could that ocean be alive? So we're going to be doing that for NASA. Uh, and we'll also be watching it with the Webb telescope as we can pick up organic molecules with the Webb. We will be watching this one. This is a satellite of Saturn. This is the only satellite in the solar system that has an atmosphere uh, big enough to fly a, a helicopter. So there's a picture of the helicopter in the lower right-hand side there called the Dragonfly. We will be landing over there on Titan in about 2035 or so and uh, hopping around to examine the surface. This is a place which is of interest for astrobiology because if it's logically possible that there's another form of life completely based on, say, liquid hydrocarbons uh, with only a trace of water, um, then this is a place to go look. This also is a place where there is a surface of solid ice. There's possibly um, a liquid ocean, liquid water ocean under that. So we'll be looking. We will be looking. We have already looked to see if there are planets around other stars. So this is a way we do that. Uh, if a planet goes in front of its star, it blocks some of the starlight. And some of the uh, wavelengths are blocked more than others if there's a molecule of certain type in the atmosphere of that planet. So that's what we do. And just to illustrate that we are already thinking about this, we, of course, start with predictions um, of what would this uh, amount of light being blocked uh, look like if there were a little Earth out there. So what we see is a prediction. Uh, we have not yet got an observation that looks like this. Uh, in fact, we rather doubt that we can do more than detect water on a little Earth around a nearby star. But that would be a huge accomplishment if we could do it at all. Because number one, you would then know that those planets do have atmospheres and uh, maybe that they have enough water to possibly have an ocean under the 
under the atmosphere. So coming, uh, but very difficult observation. The trouble here, of course, is the Earth's atmosphere is very thin skin. So there's very little geometrical possibility for seeing this. So we have to have an incredibly good set of equipment to do this. We will try. We have, on the other hand, taken direct pictures of planets already. Uh, this is a big hot one, uh, quite far from its star, which means it's not so hard to see it. Um, but how can a planet be big and hot? Well, it's and still far from the star. It's because it's new. It's still young. It's still got some of the heat of its original formation in it. So we've got one. We know we can do this. And of course, we're very interested in how well we can do this. We knew this one would be there. How about the rest? Just another completely surprising picture. Um, this is a picture of uh, uh, dusty material that comes out from a binary star. You see in the animation that uh, one star is going around from uh, the other and that they send out wind. And the picture on the left shows that they make little rings. So who knew that this could ever happen? But now that we've seen it, we have a story. So one of these days, we hope to be able to tell you that there are planets around other stars that might be a little bit like Earth, uh, but we'll wait to tell you until we actually find out. So you can follow us along on, on our various social media. Just the Google will be your friend. You can always find these places if you look. So I'll be happy to stop now and have some questions from the audience.